Bum, 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 bum. We're here, guys. We're live. Brand new Poker Live podcast. My name is Joey Anchor One, a.k.a. Chicago Joey. We are not live with a Mike Postle investigation today. Luckily, we get a break from the Mike Postle investigation. We have uh, we got a bunch of videos that come out last week. We also had a podcast this right, Bryn Kenny and uh, Jamin Burton on Tuesday, who was involved with the Postle situation in Stone. So those were uh, each very different podcasts, good in their own ways. Make sure you guys check those out. That's it. I'm not wasting any more time, guys. Joining me today on the podcast, a young man, been around Poker World for a very, 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 very long time. It feels like he's given us some uh, brutal beats in the World Series Poker. I'll tell you that right now. Some great moments in their own ways, but at the same time, some very sad moments. And uh, he's a man been playing some of the highest stakes cash games around the world for a very long time right now. A man that I think we all have a lot of interest in, a guy I've wanted to have on the podcast for a while. He won his first World Series of Poker bracelet this summer and of course there there is the hand i see the chat going crazy already they're talking about the five three we're going to talk oh, about the five three hand guys go. don't already. worry we're going to talk about the five three hand that mm-hmm. that uh that jrb played on the triton poker and we're going to talk a little about the mike possible cheating scandal because i know you guys out there are obsessed with the mike possible cheating scandal and rightfully so it is pretty crazy so we got john robert Ballon in the house jrb Good Welcome to be officially, here. man. It's uh, it's nice to finally have you on the show, man. How's it going with you? It's going well, going well. It's a real good time in my life, you know. I, I just had uh, twins three and a half months ago, oh so everything's new to me, you know. Uh, when you're a degenerate like I am, <laughs> it's like real challenge trying to decide. Okay, well, now how are we going to gamble? Now that I've got kids that I'm responsible for. Uh, okay, this yeah. is this is already so, good. So, so um, this is this is real because I mean. All, all your life, you know, you're thinking, well, I'm not sure if I really want to get married because, you know, if I'm married and go broke, you know, now, you know, she's in there with me. Right. Yeah. Then you get a little comfortable with the wifey a little bit, and then you're not so worried about that. Now I got the kids. Now it's like, now I got to be real careful. Yeah. So now, now you got to be careful in that you, you can't go broke, or you got to be, you can go broke, but you got to be more careful about going broke. <sighs> Buddy, I'm still trying to work it out, but, uh, but I imagine um, there are times when, you know, I was happy to put my last dollar in if I thought I was making the right call. But uh, right now it's like, you know, you got to scratch your head a little bit. It's, mm-hmm. it, it, it's, it's a challenge. Yeah. And, uh, you know, for me, um, I love poker. And uh, I've always recognized that I'm, you know, an action junkie, a little bit of a degenerate, uh, a little more than a little bit of a degenerate. But... Uh, um, poker has been kind of uh, a way to for me to get my fix on mm-hmm. and still actually have an edge possibly gambling and I will tell you that against a lot of people obviously I don't have an edge but uh, when you're playing soft games you know mm-hmm. uh, one of the things I've learned in my poker career is I'm never gonna be the best so the best I could do is try and be the best player amongst the people I'm playing with. Right. So, so you're pretty well known for playing a lot of the private games before it was at the Aria and now it's at other places and you do a lot of traveling all around the world as well too. So you guys right. have different games that you guys meet up in and, and different kind of spots. Shout out Rob Young. I know Rob might be out there uh, listening. I know Rob's a guy you play with pretty often. Rob's so, fantastic. Yeah, he's yeah. Uh, <laughs> certainly he's, he's a very fun guy. He's got great ideas. I love kind of talking with him. Very creative kind of mind in the way that he thinks about things, and which I don't really encounter too much in poker specifically. But I, I so when, when you when you're having these these worldwide adventures and these cash games, and now you have the new family and you have the twins and you have the the threat of going broke. How well, how does this differ now compared to let's say you know five or six years ago? Well, uh, five or six years ago, when you go broke, you're just completely on your ass, you know. Um, uh, recently, uh, for the last few years, life's been a lot more stable with uh, doing, uh, you know, partnering with Robo and uh, having a, a backer, where it's like, uh, you know, they're carrying a lot of the uh, financial risk with you. And uh, if bankroll is at zero, which it often is, or negative, uh-huh. uh then, uh, you know, he might be able to front some expenses, whatever, carry you a little bit. Um, it is scary. Uh, we were just talking about this yesterday. Um, I think it was a year and a half ago. I was deep in makeup, mm. and I was, <laughs> I was sure he was going to cut me off. 
And he kept saying, I'm not going anywhere. I'm not going anywhere. I'm right here. We're going to work this through, you know. Yeah. And, uh, you know, even though he was saying it and he sounded really believable, <laughs> I wasn't, or I was thought maybe he's bluffing me, you know. <laughs> the guy can bluff. But he, he did everything he could to let me know that he wasn't going anywhere. Don't stress about it. And, and we worked it through and we got back and, uh, you know. A few days ago, I got uh, right ahead of even. So uh, a few days ago, yeah. So from, yeah, yeah, from yeah. down from. I, I've been above even a few times since then, but uh, you know, I was. Uh, so is this the the twenty four million in makeup people have been they've been talking about it on, on Twitter? Is is that? Uh, twenty four <laughs> million. I don't know. No, I don't know. They know these no, things. No, they no, they no, seem no, to know no, these no, things. No. Not, not. I will. I dude. After that uh, little five three hand that uh, yeah. that we looked at, I was pretty I was pretty deep in makeup at that point. Really, I was already deep going into that, and then and then I was like almost even when I was winning in that game. Uh huh. So and that game was like a, a pivotal game for you in terms of it was a massive game. Yeah, it was it pretty was, big. Yeah, it was a massive game. You know, you can go up up four hundred thousand or something like that to losing five hundred. That's like a, that's a Nice little nine hundred thousand dollars swing, and uh, you know, life changing for quite a few people. Even somebody who you think is doing all right. Yeah, I mean, I think most people think that when you're playing those stakes and you're a rich guy or whatever, that that swing doesn't hurt you. But you can still see the pain on a lot of players' faces. I mean, I don't think it doesn't matter how much money you got if you go through a nine hundred thousand dollars swing, it's still going to hurt you a little bit. Absolutely, yeah. absolutely. And, you know, and uh, you know, it, I'm glad that. I still feel pain, even when I lose fifty thousand in a day or twenty uh, twenty thousand, not quite as much. But but you should feel a little pain when you're losing, you know, because uh, that's the way it's meant to be. And then mm -hmm. when you're excited, uh, when when you win, you should feel like some sort of joy. Right. I, I think most people say you you don't want to go through those emotions, those highs and lows, because then your entire day is basically dictated by how you did that session. So if you you enjoy the wins and then the losses really hurt you so it's kind of like you're when you're not playing poker it's it's just it's all related to the poker results so i think like the best players are able to i mean i know for a while i was able to turn those off and luckily i've got my emotions back because that was a terrible place for me to be kind of be like that so i think it's not very healthy to not experience those emotions personally and i'm sure a lot of people out there don't want to be those kind of robotic figures and it seems like with you you wear your emotions on your sleeve oftentimes when you're right. winning, you're, you're, you're chatting it up, you're having a good time. When you're losing, it can kind of come off on you as well, too. It, it can. And, and something I want to encourage everyone to do is when you're losing, okay, yes, it's, it, it, it's good to feel a little bit of the pain and everything, but it's also really important to be pleasant. And it's funny because you were talking about like Rob Young the other day. Mm -hmm. Rob, I have seen Rob get tortured where it he lost every single coin flip, got every cooler again and again and again, and always, always pleasant. Mm -hmm. yeah, it's nice to have a gazillion dollars behind you when you're losing <laughs> pots. I will tell you that for sure. Helps for out. sure. <laughs> you know, but, 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 smiling. He's but, smiling the truth, so much. but the truth of the matter is, is like uh, uh, when, when you're playing with people, you got to make it fun mm -hmm. for them to win too. You know, and, and in my opinion, nobody's better at that than Tom Dwan, who, by the way, used to stake me back in the day and would teach me, hey, you know what, you know, you want to be as fun as possible with these guys when you're losing to, to recreational players or whatever. Mm -hmm. And, you know, he's the one who tried to put it in my head. And actually, believe it, be honest with you, uh, Tom uh, uh, did a little bit of uh, mixing it up with Rick way back in the day when Rick Solomon. was first learning, learning how to play poker. You know, Tom gave him a tip or two. And I will tell you that nobody that I know is more pleasant when they're losing a big pot or something like that than Rick Solomon. He mm. is like the most incredible, you know, and, and, and he makes it fun. He'll be like, oh man, that was so sick, so sick, so sick. And just as he's paying you all these chips and just, he makes it fun to beat him. Yeah. I, and that's something I want to work on. I want, I want to be more fun. I want, I want people to enjoy when they beat me, you know, instead of like rolling my eyes and, you know, um, yeah. you know woe is me. I want, I, want to, I want to make it fun for them to beat me. Do you, so do you feel like you, you're getting better at that over time? Because you've kind of been in these, these private games, these recreational players for a, a bit of time now. So do you feel like that's something you kind of get better at each time out? Um, I would say that I've been playing enough that I should be, if I'm getting better over time, I should be good at it now. But I Very. still, you know, I think in certain situations I am. And especially, I'm especially aware of it when you're playing with uh, like a super recreational player that actually 
probably doesn't have much of a chance if they're playing in the long run. Mm -hmm. And you were asking about uh, uh, the guy. Uh, did I think it was like kind of brutal that he didn't want to show? Oh yeah, show Eric, his, Eric, what's his name? Is, that, is his name um, Mr. Leon? The, that's the guy that that yeah. we'll talk about that hat next. Okay. okay, I couldn't remember if that was the guy's name was Aaron Zang. Oh, oh, Aaron Zang. Oh, 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 Aaron Zang. Aaron Zang's the one who, who uh, didn't want to show his hand until. Is that the? Is that the? If same it's guy's Aaron, name? if it's Aaron, I'll rip him up. Okay, I'm just kidding. No, Aaron. Aaron Aaron's great too. Aaron's <laughs> very very pleasant as well. Yeah, uh, but uh, but yeah, you know, uh, when you're getting slow rolled and people are out of line in games where it's as a fun recreational, you really got to try and just bite your lip and say, ah, that might've been out of line, but just kind of just not make a bunch of noise about it. Oh right. my gosh, dude, why didn't you just turn over your hand? Well, none of that. And I used to do all of it. And, and I, it, one of the things I loved is Daniel and me promoting, you know, make this fun. Let's, let's, let's get the cards going a little faster. Don't do all this tanking. And I've watched the whole industry improve a lot with that. Yeah. And just, uh, being more pleasant, and when people are out of line, just uh, making making a poker table a pleasant and fun atmosphere. I mean, that's why I was drawn to the game in the first part. Mm -hmm. You know, you come into the game, and it's a fun time. You go in there, you win, you lose, but you still had a good time. You know, if you go in there and it's all robotic, and you know, people are taking twenty seconds to fold their hand pre-flop, it's not fun, right? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I I. I Personally, don't have that much fun doing that, but it does seem like, as you mentioned, that things are getting better because there is more of a initiative and more people are speaking out about it too. And I think they kind of emulate the people they see at the top. So, if you think you're supposed to behave like the people you see in these high rollers, then well, why would you not behave like them until you're aware? Oh no, maybe I shouldn't be like that. So it's kind of this thing where you see the people do it, you emulate it, and you don't even know it's why it's bad or why it's good. You're just doing it because you see them doing it. So it's kind of like you need that consistent education. And you need someone like you to kind of say this from the here at one time, here at five times, here at 10 times before I think it becomes a thing. So like this is this is sort of how the change becomes influenced, I feel like it's just people talking more about it and, and not necessarily just not giving up on the topic sort of thing like that, even though it's something that we kind of talk about consistently for a long time, right? But I feel like this sort of make things more fun has become more of a topic at the high stakes because there are more private games these days now too. And True. now you've seen the private game ecosystem in Vegas kind of evolve, how it's evolved these days, and now there's more private games. So what are your kind of your thoughts on the whole private versus public games and, and players getting taken out of certain games and then going into other games with all action players or recreational players? Um, well, I, I'm not really familiar with people getting taken out of one game or anything. Mm -hmm. but most of the games that, that I play in are people are invited and they come and play when they're, when they're invited. And uh, um, there's a, uh, it's, not, it's not a totally level playing field because, you know, uh, obviously there's superstars all around. You know, if, mm -hmm. uh, if, uh, if I'm playing with, uh, you know, Phil Galfund and, mm -hmm. uh, and David Oppenheim and, and, you know, some of these guys, I, I, I'm going to last about two weeks and be out of action. So, no. you know, uh, and I've tried it. And by the way, a lot of times when I'm playing and I'm doing well in my super friends, I go and I mix it up with the guys in Bobby's room here and there, you know, and, and Scott Seaver and all those guys, they're always happy to see me. And uh, we, we throw chips back and forth and it usually <laughs> ends up mostly fourth. But uh, yeah, we have, we have a good time. Yeah. So you, you, when you're winning, you'll go play against those guys? Sometimes. <laughs> <laughs> by the way, I mean, you laugh about it, but it, but it is true. The part of the... Part of the reason for that is I love mixed games, mm. and I, I I like a lot of those guys, and I've known a lot of those guys since I started playing. You know, forty eighty mix at the bicycle. That's where I started, and uh, um, you know, so when I go in there, you know, sometimes they'll make the game a little lower for me, a thousand, two thousand, whatever, instead of playing three thousand. They're playing three thousand, six thousand in there. I mean, these are pretty, ridiculous. Pretty, pretty high stakes, yeah. Yeah. But I mean, uh, you know, sometimes you know, we'll 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 mix it up. I, I've played with all those guys, and and I have a lot of fun. And I I can hold my own, but you're also playing with guys that are making just fantastic decisions right. all the time. That uh, that Johnny Monette, is, he's he's fantastic. And and by the way, and maybe playing great. And I heard he's been running like absolute ass for a while, or he had been. Mm -hmm. Same thing with Mike the Hat. 
Uh, all great characters and uh, good people, by the way. Really, really good people. That's and, and that's something I've uh, enjoyed seeing is, is uh, part of, part of the reason why I love like your podcast with like the the apostle situation mm -hmm. and, and even Polka and, and it, because we want to get rid of the, the the nonsense in poker. Let's keep this game and, and, and the game's evolved into a game of integrity. You know, just before I got involved in poker. There was this uh, thing of like, all right, anything to get the sucker, you know. I mean, you know, and that's that was the way. It's like if you saw somebody make a mistake or whatever, you know, it's like you would never call somebody else out on it. Now it's like table your hand, and the whole table they want the ta the the cards and the numbers to be true. If somebody got overpaid or underpaid, mm -hmm. back in the day, it's like, oh, the sucker doesn't realize that that's on him, mm. you know. And it's not like that anymore. Uh, sorry, you 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 split that. $200 in his favor. That just happened with me last night. And $200 more came to me and somebody pointed it out and went over them. And that's the way it should be. Mm, interesting. So you're saying before it wasn't like that, right? There was more angling and there was more, there was more out of line activity, it seems like. It, it, was, uh, it, was, that just, was, it was just a regular. It was that was norm. part of the game. Right. Part of the game was get the sucker for the maximum amount of money. I remember Puggy Pearson proudly telling me the story about how he was playing against that donkey Doyle Brunson and Doyle bet me 10,000 and I took a $10,000 rack off of his stack of racks and raised him 10,000 with his own rack and he's so <laughs> proud of that story you know and I, I honestly wonder if Doyle didn't allow him to get away with it just because Puggy's such a sucker because Puggy 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 used to feel like you know if he Puggy's thing was just to get over on somebody if he felt like he got over on that was like so satisfying to him so and in my mind there's a good chance Doyle knew exactly what Puggy was doing and just like let him get away with it because in the end he's gonna win all the money anyways you know yeah it would seem like Doyle has probably seen it all in terms of the angle shooting there's like a story up there a clip where he talks about he saw three guys die at the poker table like you saw a guy die at the poker table oh, yeah, actually right. die there and he had a shotgun in his face but I'm like what the yeah 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 I mean yes, what, what yes. has this guy seen been yes. playing since the 50s or 60s it's uh Yes. Can you imagine the kind of uh, the hustles he's kind of seen over the years and how he's seen the game evolve? I mean, 85 years old, 86 years old, man. That's uh... <laughs> Bobby Walton told me a story. He said a, a guy, there was a massive hand, and probably because of the excitement of the hand, the guy died and what? he had the winning hands. And so there was discussion at the table, well, who's going to win this pot? The guy's dead. And he said the, the floor man came over and it was like a famous guy. And I don't know who it was, but we're going to find out who it was at some point. He came over and says, the guy's dead, hand's dead. What? <laughs> the guy's dead, hand's dead. Come on now. Are you what? kidding me? That was the ruling? <laughs> the guy's dead, the hand's dead. Oh my gosh. I need to get a, I need, I need to get Matt Savage's input on that ruling right there. That seems so where'd the money go? The, the casino took the money? Uh, no, I guess the other guy chopped it up. I what? Guess the second or the second best player took it or something. The guy's dead, hands dead. What a ruling. I mean, Jesus Christ. <laughs> what, what, when, when did this go down? When was this? Oh, it was like 30, 40 years ago. Okay, 30, this is yeah, old school, yeah, yeah, right? Yeah, old school. Wow. It was at the Silverbird or something this like that. Dead, dead, dead man theory optimal right here. This is a little different than crotch theory optimal. It's kind of taking over the world right now. Oh, it's like possible boy. situation. So uh, what, when did you start? You said you started playing the bike. And when did you start playing, I, getting into that? Mixed I, games then? I was uh, really into pool. I've always been an action guy. Action junkie. Loved action. Mm -hmm. In fact, uh, there's a song that just came out recently. It says, big pocket, little pocket. <laughs> yeah, a big, po big bank, take little bank. Yeah. So when we were kids... We would actually have a game called Big Big Bank Take Little Bank, and we'd reach in the pocket, and whoever had more money got to swallow up the bankroll of the guy with the little money. So when That's I went, when I went to school, I tried to always make sure I had ten dollars in my pocket because anybody who had two or three dollars was going to get. If we played, I, I was ready to play. But you were just out all your money. I mean, this is as a little kid I'm playing this. Right. Like 11, 12 years old. So I mean, I, I I've always liked action, and you know. And, and, and seriously, you go home and say, man, maybe I should come home. Maybe I should come to school with a 20 tomorrow. Mm. I remember telling Phil Ivey about that story years ago, and he's just like, I think I like that game. I think I like that game. You, know? <laughs> <laughs> you see Phil walking around with $300,000 <laughs> oh, yeah, or I'm something sure like that. Could, yeah, yeah. yeah, 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 yeah. I'm sure he likes big. So I, I thought this was a myth, mythical game. I don't think this game actually took place. Why right. would you ever play the game if you didn't have a lot of money in your pocket? 
Well, you thought you had more money than the guy you were playing against. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Just, just make the, the, the degenerate life. So they're not necessarily thinking uh, logically all the time in situations like that. So we would play in college. We would play uh, pool, ping pong, foosball. Mm -hmm. Everything always had to be for something. We weren't playing for money so much in college. So we were playing for push-ups a lot of time. Beer. And yet, yeah, yeah, yeah. But that, you know, dinners, whatever. But uh, there was a lot of, you know, there was a time when I was really ripped because I did so many push-ups and they would just talk all the shit to me saying, oh man, Robert, you're looking all swelled up. It's great. Yeah, that was probably the best thing for me is playing ping pong. And then you have to do the push-ups and you have to get right back on and play the next game. So you go from, I went from action. I was action junkie. Then playing a lot of pool and I had a big score at Hard Times in Bellflower. Uh, it's it's got to be about 20 years ago now, uh, where I won $5,000 in, in a pool room, which is like a big, big score in a pool room. This is 20 years ago. And this is 20 years ago, okay. yes. And you know, the money's burning a hole in my pocket, <laughs> and I see the bicycle casino says says California Blackjack. I'm like, California Blackjack, what's that? So uh -huh. I go in there, and they show me how there's no bust Blackjack, all this other stuff. I have no idea what I'm doing. I win 20000 Money's burning a hole in my pocket. It's like 3 in the morning. And I said, hey, let me try this. My hand is poker. And they put me in some 612 game or something like that. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I lose $300 within a couple orbits, but I'm bored out of my mind. I'm like, you have a higher stakes game. And the only one going was a mixed game, which was a 40-80 mix. And immediately was at 8160 real quickly once they saw that I really had no clue what I was doing and uh, I lost $13,000 my first night playing poker. Yeah. And you're hooked ever since, huh? Yeah, 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 and I've been hooked ever since. <laughs> by the morning I figured, oh, I, I had figured it out. That the games were high-low, no qualifier, Omaha high-low, and uh, stud eight or better. Those were, the, the, that was the mix, and I'm a guy who never played cards in his life before, you know, this is, 13,000, that's what it cost me to, on my first night playing poker. Yeah. Yeah. We, don't, we do not recommend this at the Poker Life Podcast to do that, guys. Do not jump into the three game mixed. Uh, yeah. If you don't know how to play, <laughs> yeah, it's probably not going to be yeah. optimal in the short term, but I guess in the long term. So, what you started playing more poker ever since then and, and just kind of did. gradually progressed to no limit as the, the boom sort of started to take place? I did. And, and, and I was promoting nightclubs at the time and I was doing very well in nightlife. And basically, poker was where I just got rid of all my money. Mm. I was like, I must have, man, I was losing. I was losing. I, I was one of those guys, as soon as I walked in the uh, poker room, there was like a list out of Oh, oh yes, 100%. When I walked into the pool room, the guys would run outside to the parking lot to meet me before I went inside because they didn't want anybody else, but anyone else making a game with me. Oh, yeah, no, I was like the ultimate sucker. Now mm. I'm just a little bit of a sucker. Back then I was the ultimate. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Now I lost hundreds of thousands. I, I would say my first three or four years I lost – close to a half a million wow. and probably could only afford to have lost maybe 150,000. So, I mean, it was like, yeah, yeah, that was, uh, what, so what does that feel like? I guess when, when you're doing that, are, are you present in the moment that these guys are kind of coming after me because they know I'm, I'm a spot in these situations or they at think the time? I'm a spot, right? They think I'm a spot, but <laughs> they're, you're going to give me the six, seven and the breaks and pool. <laughs> Come on, bring it, bring it. Mm -hmm. And I mean, scratching my head, wondering how in the world I lost that game or, you know, are going and playing poker. These guys all are so happy to play. I love the whole board going. I'm like, all right, you guys bring it on. Cause I thought, you know, even if I I felt I was like a little behind, I figured I was smarter than uh, than most of them, and I was going to figure out figure out what I was doing wrong, and I'd get it right eventually. Right. And uh, you know, uh, there's a lot of very very smart people in poker, especially in high limit poker. Mm -hmm. And I wasn't playing high limit at the time. Uh, at one, uh, the bicycle casino actually offered me to. They said, "Listen, you know, we know you promote clubs and you're busy." But when you're here, why don't we pay you while you're playing? Mm. So I was getting paid $27 an hour to play. And so in my mind, I'm thinking, well, all I got to do is just break even. $27 an hour was like a decent little thing. I love playing anyways. I love playing poker anyways. So, yeah. Yeah, yeah, there yeah. You go. I love playing poker anyways. So, uh, you know, might as well get paid to play. Yeah. You know, are we good? No, I'm just looking at the thing. It's a little, it's a little loose. I'm just okay, yeah. Go ahead. Put it up here. 
Oh, no, it's all right. It's all right. Okay. So <laughs> we're twisting it. Yeah. We're getting the twist. So uh, you know, I was getting paid to play, and the idea that it, even even with that amount of money, yeah, which isn't like huge, but you know, I'm getting, I'm still hoping to break even. Yeah, it's still something. You know, I'm still losing. Then, then Hustler offered me more. They offered me forty dollars an hour, thirty-five or forty an hour to go play over there. So I started doing the mixed game over at the Hustler, uh-huh. and. You know, it's interesting because I was playing the 4080 game and running the 4080 game, and I got to be just around a break-even player towards the end of my hustler run. I, I, no, I still lost money, but when I was playing 4080, Alan Cunningham, David Gray, uh, uh, Yosh Nakano, and uh, there was Steve Wolf, there was a, a, a Lee Salem, all the, the big and David Oppenheim, 400, 800. That was the game in uh, in L.A. Mm-hmm. The 400, 800 was equivalent to the Bobby's room. Bobby's room played bigger, but I mean, that was like our thing. And then, you know, Larry Flint was around and sometimes he would play a big stud game with all the guys. But uh, that was my first taste of seeing, you know, and then Phil Ivey would come in there. Mm-hmm. And, you know, and that, that was my first taste of seeing big the Johnny Chan, 400, 800 mix. That's, that's what, and you know, that's when my eyes kind of got big for poker. And I always knew that that game was way out of my league. But every once in a while, like I, I ran up a nice little, I think I was up like 20 or 30,000 in the 4080 one day. Mm-hmm. And I went and took a shot at the 4800. <laughs> Why not? I took a shot and somehow I had this hand and, and, and they play, when they play the 4800, they use these white chips and they're like all over the place when you have this massive pot. I had a six way capped pot and I had two aces and they held up. And I remember, and Yosh told me, he's like, Robert, that's a three push pot because it takes the dealer three pushes to get all wow, the chips yeah. to you. And I just remember having this massive stack playing in, in, in the one shot I took at the 40, 400, 800. Yeah. And then you kept playing the 400, 800 after you had this winning session? Ooh, no, no, no. No? I, mean, I don't know. I went on little rushes. Lane Flat came in there one day and uh, they pretended like he was uh, drunk. He may have been drunk. He probably was drunk and played me heads up Omaha high low and depleted my bankroll Jeez. real quickly. Yep. Jeff Lissandro did the same. Jeff Lissandro and but Jeff at least Jeff Jeff was the one who ultimately busted me in L.A. But he's like, you know what? Uh, and I was like, hey, you know, uh, you busted me. Uh, can, I, can, I, can I borrow 5000 from you? He's like, I'm not going to give you a dollar, but I tell you what I will do. He's like, I'm going over to Prague. I'm starting a poker room out there. Why don't you come out there and help me run it? And uh, we'll, we'll, we'll do something, and I'll teach you a little something about poker. And uh, so Jeff, Jeff was like my first like mentor teacher in poker. And, mm-hmm. you know, he told me a lot of things I was doing wrong. And, you know, really, you know, Jeff, Jeff is not like a technically sound player, but he's mm-hmm. a real smart guy and understands people. And, uh, you know, uh, uh, a lot of people don't really get him or understand him, but, but he's a good, good dude. And uh, he was the one who first, like, made me break and say, oh, I had my first, like, real profitable poker months in Prague mm-hmm. where I was like, okay, wow, well, now, I'm, now I'm actually an earner where I was certain that I was earning in poker. And that was, that'd be, that was, I was 32 years old when I went out there. I'm 49 now. That was 15 years ago already. Wow. Yeah, yeah. So yeah. that was in, uh, what, 2002? Um, yeah, 2002, wow, 2003. 2002. Right, yeah. Wow, so yeah. you got to Prague. This is kind of before even, you know, kind of poker was on ESPN a little bit, but the money maker was like 03, I believe, or something like that, right? 03, 02, 04, somewhere. That, I of, think so, yes. One of those years before it really yeah. started kicking up. So you're mm-hmm. already out in Prague, and then once the ESPN things happen, it seemed like, seemed like once you got on there, you were on there pretty often and you were kind of, they always showed you, they love talking about you. You became a, 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 like a staple main character, character of those ESPN broadcasts. Correct. Yeah, yeah. 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 I made a final table with, uh, with Ivy and Jennifer Harmon mm-hmm. at the Rio, like in, I think that was 2005. And from there on, that's, uh, you know, it's one of those things. There's certain characters that the cameras gravitate t- towards right. in, in those events, and I was one of the characters, and I'm happy to be, too. I was happy, happy to be one of those characters, and then Survivor came about, and, you know, now it's like, oh, he's the poker player who did Survivor, you know, <laughs> Survivor, wow. What, what are your thoughts on that in, in retrospect? Because obviously that's a big part of, even when I, I put the podcast out, what do people want to know about 
it's a lot of high stakes stuff, obviously the high stakes stories, but also Survivor too, because you were that was, that seems like a pretty big part of your legacy in poker now in a lot of ways. Um, Survivor, something that I could never see myself ever doing again, by the way, but it was an experience, a life experience that I kind of accidentally got sucked into. Mm-hmm. Uh, to be honest with you, the uh, the girl that was recruiting me to do Survivor, they got some super hot girl doing that, whatever, and I just wanted to bang her, so I just entertained it. I knew for sure, for I knew for sure I wasn't doing Survivor, but she and I just went, oh, okay. She's like, well, we're and I'm like, well, I'll come over to your bar and meet you over there. She was bartending somewhere too, whatever, you know. And I just was trying to talk to her. Never did that, by the way. Never hooked up with her. But uh, but uh, you know, now you're around all these people that are dying to be on Survivor. I mean, it's like their life dream. Hell yeah. 5,000 people trying to, and it's down to like a group of like 40. And I'm like, you know, and I, I knew I wasn't going to do it, but I was, uh, these guys are like so excited. And then right. you just kind of catch that fire. And I'm like, all right, fine, I'll go do it. And uh, my plan was go in there and just get knocked out real quickly, you know, whatever. And then you get on there and it's like, you know, the pack starts thinning. You're like, wow, I got a real shot to do this. You mm-hmm. know, I had my strategy, but you know, after a few days of being hungry out there, I'm like, forget this shit. I'm out of here. And, uh, but, but, but it wasn't, it, it, it was a great life experience. It really was. I'm glad I did it. I'm glad I did it. Is there like a takeaway you, you take away from something like Survivor going on that, whether it's with just the living or the food or the dynamic between the people? Um, there were, were several takeaways right now. Not one in particular comes into mind, but uh, I remember when we were hungry, we were, we, we'd have days when we were, we were so hungry, like everybody, all of a sudden one guy would start talking about this amazing food experience he had or whatever. Mm-hmm. And we're like, no, man, how are you going to talk about that? <laughs> and then we got into this like euphoria where we talk about these amazing foods. And, and then I hit him with the, you know, when the fajita comes out there and they take the top off and the steam just hits you. And, you, and I mean, I, they almost all passed out when I talk. I mean, you just imagine you haven't had a thing to eat for three or four Jeez. days. And, and, but at, at what happened was it creates this euphoria. It, it, it kind of calmed us down. All of a sudden, it was like a little bit satisfying. We found that talking about that, it, it's weird. I mean, is there a psychology behind that? I don't know, but it, it worked. It worked. It, like, so whenever we were real hungry, we'd do that little food thing, piss each other off, and all of a sudden, we'd be a little bit satisfied. And yeah. that would, I didn't even know that was possible. I didn't know you could talk <laughs> about the food, and then you... I guess you can imagine yourself eating it, potentially, or something like that. You can think about the feeling that you have when you're consuming that food, I guess. So one of the coolest experiences for me on Survivor is a, a bluff I pulled. They, uh, we, we put these crab traps out and you, uh, you, you're supposed to catch cra- crabs, mm. but an eel ended up in my, in my trap and I'm up there. And so now you have just a little bit of fish and food, whatever. And I got this eel, it's about this long and it's ugly and the teeth are just nasty and it's like a shit brown color. And, uh, um, I'm like, anybody, anybody want some of this? And everybody's like, oh, nasty, whatever. And I had a bite of it. Buddy, I'm telling you, it was like the most delicious sweet meat I'd ever had. And I had a bite and I'm like, nobody wants any? No, 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 no. And I just pretended to like be enduring this thing. And a deep down inside, I was like, oh my gosh, this is the greatest meat ever. And I got to eat the entire eel on my own. Nobody else had a bite of it. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Have you had eel since then? Absolutely. Oh, love, so it's love, a, it's a, love it's eel. Delicious food. Oh, yeah, yeah. No, no. It's like a, in any sushi bar, you get the eel. It's fantastic. Yeah. Mm, I don't think we, yeah. we, do, we usually don't get the eel. So. Yeah, no. My, my wife, that's our favorite dish, the, the eel on t- uh, like a dragon roll that has eel on it. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Do you have a favorite food spot in, in Las Vegas? Because I'm imagining you, you enjoy, mm-hmm. enjoy I, some nice restaurants. I have, I have many, many favorite food spots, but uh, it's really hard to beat cut over yeah, there at the, Palazzo, yeah, Palazzo and I, which I haven't been to in a while. But my number one favorite is actually L'Atelier over at uh, MGM. Mm. Yeah, it's it's uh, it's Joel Robichon, mm-hmm. but Joel Robichon, if you're going to go over there, it's like a three hour, you know, you do that for Valentine's with your yeah, girl, a, whatever, you know, course. but it's like nobody really wants to spend three and a half hours in dinner. 
but uh, you get the same quality of food right next door. It's like an a la carte restaurant. Mm -hmm. and, uh, you is can that the one that's, that's the place that's connected to, to his main building right there? So it's like a little bar area? Or is it right in that area where all the restaurants are back there at MGM? It, it's, in, it's in the restaurants okay. area. It's, it's its own restaurant. It's okay, a beautiful so restaurant. Okay. It's a beautiful restaurant for sure. But I mean, uh, I mean, it, it's a very expensive restaurant, mm -hmm. but uh, the food's just like outrageous. If you ever really feel like, okay, I don't mind blowing you know $700 on dinner, you go over there and it's like the greatest. That's a spot to go to. Well, I'm sure someone out there is watching right now. They'll, they'll end up going there from this recommendation alone. Oh, 100%. So they'll, uh, they'll, they'll enjoy themselves. <laughs> Here, let's, let's talk a little bit about this 5-3 offsuit hand. Oh, so, come on. <laughs> so, so you played a hand on Triton Poker, and I made a video on it after I saw it, and I put the, I put the Titanic theme to it. And uh, one of my uh, – I don't know what came over when I was watching this. I was just like, man, this reminds me of Titanic. It's the Titanic shinking. The band's playing as the ship goes down. It just had these, it had this, you're, you're drinking the wine, you're getting a massage, you're, 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 you're not looking very happy in that situation. So let's yeah. talk about the hand first of all, okay? Well, so, so my man opens up, I think it was opening, on, he opens under the gun. I think there's one or two calls. You decide to squeeze the 5-3 from the small blind. He four bets and then you decided to shove all in for about, what is it, 200, how, how much you shove in for there? Like two, I think it was, it was, it was like, I think like four hundred thousand. It's, it's, yeah. it's a pretty big. It's a pretty big. It's a pretty big shove free flop. So, yeah. what are you thinking there? Well, first of all, uh, the video, which I think is brilliant, by the way, that Titanic theme, everything. Thank I you. put this video on. If I, yeah. Robo texts me, he's like, "Dude, you saw you saw the video online." He's and I said, "I said, I said, what are you talking about?" He's like, "Ah, don't worry about it, man. It's good advertising for you, anyways. Don't worry." I'm like, "What? What are you talking about? What are you talking about?" I immediately go and and put this video on, and my wife's watching it with me, and. I can't believe it. I'm watching this Titanic. And for me, I'm just like watching it with big eyes. And I think this is hilarious. My wife is horrified by the video. <laughs> <laughs> She's like, baby, what, why, why, why are you even watching this? It was so funny. Because when, when you met my I, wife. I did, I did meet her. <laughs> yeah, she did yeah. tell me this. Yeah, she did yeah. talk to your wife. She, she was like, I know I like that video. I said, <laughs> he was like, no, nah, I was not. I liked it. I was like, yeah, I mean, listen, you know, you put in, you put in the, the few hundred thousand with the five, three in that spot. Like, I mean, hey, you know what I'm saying? It's a, yeah. it's a, it's a exploratory kind of play preflop there. So Mr. Liang, who doesn't speak a word of English, by the way, and uh, he's actually quite a pleasant, nice guy. And uh, we played a lot of poker together. Um, and he, he, he he obviously held over on me then, but the trips before I, I'd done pretty well against him mm -hmm. and he sees me as kind of nuts and uh, um, is going to give me more action than he's going to give anyone else. And uh, right here, I'm thinking Mr. Young's pretty snug mm -hmm. pre-flop. And when I opened, whatever, he re-raised, he, he looked a little uneasy with his re-raise. Like, you know, to be honest with you, he's the kind of guy who's going to flat with ace-king a lot of times. Mm -hmm. He's not really. Not always gonna. Yeah, yeah. So I, I actually thought that uh, he, he didn't love his raise, and that was my gut. And so I went with my gut, and I, and I, and I jammed all in, and I thought I, that he was going to fold. And, you know, Robo absolutely hated my play. And he's like, dude, Liang three bets you. I mean, he's the last person. And, you know, the guy thinks you're nuts. Of course he's going to call you. He's going to, uh, you know, for, for sure you're supposed to have kings or aces there, you know. And uh, um, I, I, I was making a move. I was making a move. And uh, I, I had a read. And my read was somewhat correct. He was a little uneasy raising with the ace king. It's not like he had two kings, two aces. Right. But. Uh, so, yeah. so you decided. So he thinks you're crazy. You decide to validate his assumption by by squeezing pre and then and then but I, I guess from that guy that's the kind of guy you're gonna get you're gonna get action from forever though um i i i am but uh i mean the guy lives in china so mm -hmm. i mean it's not like i'm gonna see him, play that, him that much anyway so that that, yeah, that yeah, person yeah. doesn't matter no but but uh, i'll run into him probably you know once or twice a year and uh uh, maybe two or three times a year, probably. Mm -hmm. But uh, you know, he's always going to want to play with me. I know that. That's true. But, and so are a lot of people that uh, watched your video. You think so? <laughs> so do, do you think do you think things like that are are overall good because people see you make plays, but at the same time, it's not I like mean, the, that's part of your regular I, arsenal, unless it I, is. I, I, <laughs> I don't know. Listen, I, listen, I, for sure, I, I I'm somebody who 
is not afraid to pull the trigger. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, part of that has to do with a little of my mentoring from Tom Dwan. When I, you know, uh, Tom, it, it was interesting because you get staked by different people. And I remember the first night I lost 250,000. I texted Tom, I said, minus 250 tonight. He was in Hong Kong. And I'm like scared of his response. His response was, dude, sorry, bro, tough night, man. That sucks. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Like, like he was like, he felt bad for me that I lost the 250 and I'm thinking, dude, I just torched 250 of your money, you know, but, uh, um, and he was really, really, uh, uh, pleasant. And it, his thing is like the, the, this is part of the course of poker. How things work, and right? then later on, of course, I find out that, you know, he's, he might've torched 5 million here or there, you know what I mean? So, so, uh, um, you know, everything's relative, but, uh, but that hand I went with my read and to this day I will tell you that Robel thinks that my play was absolutely horrendous 99% of the poker world thinks it was horrendous I made a move uh, to be to be fair it, we're being very results orientated because yeah. if he does fold there for some reason or if you win the hand you know what I mean like I think the reason what makes it interesting to the viewers is that one you know you didn't win the hand unfortunately two you have that look on your face that's just like man this guy's like really fucking going through it right now and then three the guy kind of slow rolls you in a way where he, he tell he's like no no show me your hand and you're like small pair small pair. yes i obviously didn't want to show my hand right like you're, you're I, not... I didn't want to show my hand because i didn't want to roll to see what i was doing that with or because you know i didn't want the cameras to see i don't know but the cameras had already seen my hand anyways i was just like embarrassed you know yeah. it was uh yeah, not one of my best moments. I, mean, I think know. I think we've all made plays that we're not not proud of in, in retrospect with, yeah. with slightly marginal hands, and I think that's just how things go sometimes yeah, too. But he didn't even think about it. He just snap called me with that ace king. It was like, oh well, okay here. Yeah. You know, I, by the way, if I'm in his spot, I'm probably folding ace king right there. I think a lot of people are folding ace king right there. You know, eh, I don't know. Uh, yeah, we yeah. go back. We go back to what you said. He thinks I'm crazy. There it is. <laughs> <laughs> That's Robles' point too. And, and then I guess immediately <laughs> after that, you played it up. Like literally, like we said two hands later, you get the aces. So you're like, okay, JRB is going to make a comeback here. The same guy's got set of nines, and the flop comes nine high, and I'm like, oh, here I yeah. come. Here. Like, and then you just leave. That's it. Done. The it's game's just over. A and then, nice little exclamation pot. pot. Yeah, yeah, that's. Uh, yeah. What, what do you do after that? What happens? What do you go back to the? You just take a walk for a while, or what, what's what's the, what's the vibe like? How oh, do we get man, over this? Dude. Oh, he's gonna quit me. He's gonna quit me. <laughs> Is that what you <laughs> <laughs> No, I, I. Yeah, that was. Uh, that, by the way, I think I think that was the last I ended up on that trip. That was it. I, I, I'm pretty sure I had a two week break after that. Uh, two week uh, unexpected break. No, yeah. No, yeah. I I was. Yeah, that was that was tough. That was. I, it says five three off. I didn't have five three off. Did I have five three off? Five three five three suited. Five three oh. Oh, I was five three suited. Five three suited. Okay. It says five three oh. I'm. Okay. Five, I was five. I was suited, sir. Five three. Five suited. three of hearts, please. Maybe change the titles. Make it suited. <laughs> five three suited. Hold on. So so I'm playing in the World Series uh, this summer, and it's day one, and I sit down, and this kid two seats over from me he looks like he just turned twenty one. Char Bear fans, dude, so nice to meet you. Can I get a quick picture? We, you know, we were about to start the World Series. I'm like, sure. He's like, man, dude, like, you're one of my favorites. But what happened to you on that 5 3 hand? <laughs> like, I, immediately, like, he was jocking me, and all of a sudden, like, dude, well, what's up with the 5 3 hand? <laughs> And I mean, for some reason, I, I I almost like kind of snapped at him because I was like, you know, I was kind of like excited, you know, the guy's jocking me a little yeah. bit. And then I was like, well, whatever. And I'm like, dude, I'm like, I, I made a move. You never made a move on somebody? I made a move. That's mm -hmm. That was my response. But, you know, listen, that was like 5-3 is not the best hand to be making moves with. You know? Yeah. Yeah. I think I think had I had you like... You blocked ace-5 and ace-3. I think if I showed up with 9-8 suited, mm -hmm. I think the whole poker world would have been a little more... Easy on me on that? What do you think? No? Probably, yeah. Yeah. 5 3, I mean, I don't know. Just the, the, they see 5 3, and in their minds, I think people just see two cards under five and they get a little excited about it. So, I don't know. I, By I the mean, way, there was a five in the door. Yeah, there was. You're right. There was a five in the door, and I was like, wow, man, this is a massive pot. If I get this guy with this pot, 
with this he's one. Got, oh. He's going to have suicide. He got a lot of suicide equity on your side. I call it suicide equity when you make your opponent want to kill their chips, right? You make their chips want to jump off the bridge, jump off the bridge equity. So sometimes you can make crazy plays like that and justify it with that. And if you win the hand, then they're going to launch off more money. When I get called, what am I, like a 62, 38 dog, something like that? Like when a, he has the ace king. Yeah. I think it was that, yeah. It's not, you something weren't, like you that. weren't, could be worse. Yeah, yeah, that's what, you know, if you're making a move and you get called, that's not bad, but that was a massive plot. A massive Why didn't you run it twice? That's a good question, David K. As it says in the YouTube chat. Oh, yeah, on, uh, in a lot of games in Asia, they don't run it twice. Okay. And on this televised situation, um, where did maybe I ran it twice with Rob. I don't know. Oh, yeah, oh, and, and sorry, Mr. Liang likes to run it once. Yeah, Rob only runs it once too. Mr. Mm -hmm. Leong, he, he's a one-time guy. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Bobby See, Baldwin's a one-time guy. Rob Young's a one-time guy. Mr. Young's a one-time guy. I wish I was rich enough to be a one-time guy, but if I was, I'd be a one-time guy. You'd be a one-time guy too. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and I'll tell you why. Uh, I like to encourage people to run it once because it creates a dynamic at the table where now somebody's felt it and tilted and it's gonna create more action in the future. Right. Okay. I, I really think if you can afford the swings, one time is a, is a great way to go. Because, I mean, people get punished and it creates, like, different emotions at the table. And it, it's a disruption mm -hmm. in the regular poker game. And it, it's an opportunity f to recognize different uh, variations in the game. You know what I mean? So you think you handle running at once pretty well then, I'm assuming, to... No, no, I, I, no! Don't. I don't have a bankroll big enough to handle it. <laughs> I'm just saying, if I could afford to, I would definitely be running it once. I remember when when I was really pumped up. I remember going and playing in uh, in, in Bobby's room, and I was in a cap pot with uh, David Oppenheim, and he's like, "Run it twice." I'm like, "No, no, no just run it once." Mm -hmm. And he's like, "Dude, it's a big pot." I'm like, "Dave, it's eighty thousand. It's not really a big pot." And it was so funny because Dave Oppenheim was like one of my idols when I'm like learning poker and mm -hmm. he's like one of the big dogs. And here I am telling him that's not really a big pot. You know? But at that time I was super pumped up. I was super pumped up and on my own actually at that time when that mm -hmm. happened. It didn't last very long. So what, what, what's made you want to, people say they want to see the clip. Listen, the clip is, you know, fuck it. Let's just play the clip. Are you serious? <laughs> We, we can get a little bit of the clip up here. Hold on a second. Dude, the, the clip is like 10 minutes long. No, I'll just play it. I'll play just a little bit of the 5-3 part here. I'll give you guys I'll give you guys a, a couple minutes of the 5-3 and then uh, just because people people seem. I'll show you a minute and then I'll put the link below in the description. You guys can go over there. It has to be in there. one of the most brilliant videos ever put out. Like uh, that was. Thank you. I don't know where the idea. Actually, the idea came from uh, my buddy Jesse who did a a uh, video, like a movie edit through a hand. And I was like, you know what? I'm gonna try one of these. And I just happened to see the hand. And then I said, okay, let me kind of do that. We have the uh, Postle Investigations back here. We'll talk about the Mike Postle thing here, here next. I'm curious to get your take on that whole, the guy playing on a live stream and uh, and having access to to the whole cards here. So let me get this, let me get this beautiful hand. I'll show you guys just a little bit of it, okay? But it's kind of sad. Oh man, this is, this is kind of sad. JRB's already, he's already kind of, I feel him right now. We won't look at this part. So here, mm. here's the hand, guys. So, so Liang raises under the gun with Ace King. JRB squeezes the five three. Tom Dwan and Rob Young calls. Those guys are known to fold the three bets in position. <laughs> That's awesome. <laughs> Trying to decide what to four bet to. Thank God you weren't texting something out of line right there. I was I was wondering that too. They kind of catch it. Half the JRB squeeze. Oh, that was Bobby Baldwin. He's a, like, yeah, 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 yeah. seventy six million. <laughs> I came here prepared to take one hit. <laughs> <laughs> Pull them all out. This is great. JRB actually shoves. 5 3 suited. Quick call. He snap calls you. Wow. Oh, beat me in the pot. It's crazy. Wait, wait, wait. 
He doesn't look happy, you're right. Let's go. You're open and I'll have two the trees at the end. Here comes a five in the door. Come on. Just Maybe it'll change. Just hold up one time. Maybe it'll change. No, I, I edited this video, guys. It's the first time I ever tried something like this one. So now you see the five. Now you're kind of happy. <laughs> that can't have been my face. That's really. your you, face, you I added, swear to God. Not during the that's hand, really? It's right now. Look, oh that's your gosh. face. I mean, you're, you're in like euphoria <laughs> getting the massage. <laughs> Yes, you want to see him? Uh, yeah. <laughs> that is my face. You. What do I have to do? Turn it around on you, who is an extremely great strategic player in your daily life. <laughs> I had to get rid of my biggest strategic threat, who is you. Nice hand. Uh, yeah, yeah. It's a sad hand right there. Wow. wow, that's a big pot. Holy, wow. This guy's crazy right here, man. Ian. This guy's so, so stupid. Man. <laughs> That's my favorite oh, yeah. moment of the video. <laughs> 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 Don't call my sister. I don't understand. I just don't understand. Even for him, that's just like... Like, he didn't even think about it. <laughs> 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 the hand for you guys if you guys want to uh if you guys want to check that out it's over on uh on youtube you're going to search for jean robert poker and it's going to be one of the first videos that comes up so so yeah that's uh yeah. it makes for a great moment i mean you've had some great tv moments over time you had the the one where uh what's the one you're playing against the guy and he's like bye bye oh and you yes. think you you think you won the hand me. yeah you think you win the hand yes. and then you're like yes that's what i'm talking about I you look handsome today and then unfortunately uh, I think uh, Andrew, what was it? Uh, Ruthless. Ruthless lets you know. Adam Levy, he lets you know, oh, no, you can still lose. Yes. You're like, ah. And yeah. then the, the river card comes, and, and the whole entire room just, like, they react in such a such yeah. an agony. It's, yeah, it's. it's That's yeah, a pretty good clip. You have, you have a little taste of it in, within this video yeah. as well. Yeah. Yeah. That's a, that was a brilliant video. Seriously, I, I, I got a lot of joy out of it. My wife did not. And, uh, no. Yeah. It's a hand that goes down in infamy right there. Do you have any hands where you win win big pots on stream? Because I feel like most of the moments we know are you like taking some sick beat. It's not even like these aren't these aren't like normal. These are like sick beats. I feel like we yeah. see you taking all that. Anytime, on anytime I've had like like an emotional hand where it's like okay, it's all in. I'm in good shape. Whatever. I I feel like it's coming. So it's like, uh, I, I I mean obviously I've won plenty of good pots. I mean I've gotten pretty deep in the in the main event. So. You know, I had to win some big pots. But yeah, but uh, a lot of them, uh, the all-ins mm -hmm. have not, I've not fared too well in the all-ins, for yeah. sure, for sure. And it's kind of, uh, it's kind of good for me with my all-in live cash games because it's like, you know it could be coming, so, you know, I, don't, I, I don't get so emotional in the cash game so much now. I yeah. try not to, yeah. I'm sure, yeah. This, that, that, probably why they play you though. It's probably like, like playing with you, the people, is that you, you are showing that emotion, though, whether it's positive or negative. I think that's probably one reason why, I mean, for other reasons why, too, I think that you just have a big personality in general and people like being around that, too. But I would imagine just the way you react just makes things interesting for players. For sure, for sure. Yeah. And by the way, sometimes uh, being in agony and in pain, uh, the, the players at the table love that, too, <laughs> because they're like, okay, now, all right, I, I, I smell blood, and they're ready to come at you. Yeah, yeah. that's... Uh, Let's talk about this Mike Paulson thing real quick because so obviously people are kind of obsessed about it and you've been in games, private games, in the casino, outside of casino. What are kind of your thoughts on on seeing this guy play on this live stream for over a year and 
and it looks like he's the crotch man staring at his crotch and and having all these winning sessions and, and being the top winner in the games and what are kind of your thoughts from, from where you sit at in the poker world is that something that you worry about those sorts of things happening to you um for sure we can all worry about them happening to us i mean uh, uh what's happening with this i i love that you guys are exposing all of it mm -hmm. because uh I really really love to have like a clean playing field I, I i i would love for all of poker to just be like clean and just playing with the cards and just old school studying do they have it do they not right and uh you know the games evolved a lot so it's a lot more math oriented but uh live games are still a lot about you know getting live reads on people mm -hmm. i know uh people that play and have done all the study and have all the the uh what's it called those charts all the know? charts yeah yeah yeah, yeah, yeah. Stuff, yeah yeah but but when they play in a live game you can see when they have it and when they don't have it and i'm happy to play with those people sometimes all the time i wouldn't be happy to play with them you know like uh, Tosso guy yeah 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 but but uh but yeah so uh wh what do i think about uh i mean uh, I, i'm glad you guys busted him and i hope he's out of there and and uh you know uh, I hate to see it, but I mean, he 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 had help, right? That's what that's what people seem to think. Yeah, it's it's not confirmed yet, but it would appear that there probably was one or more people helping him. Yeah, yeah. So we don't know exactly what that is involved yet, and they're doing their own investigation on the casino side too. Uh huh. So we don't really know exactly what's going to take place. There's a lawsuit filed against Stones Live, against uh, the tournament director and the guy in charge of the show, and then against Mike Posse for thirty million dollars right now. So yeah. it makes no sense to me that he could have done this on his own. Right. Yeah. Just so he had to have he had to be getting some sort of help. That's 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 the way, that's the way I see it. And then when he like you know he he's he's confused in the hand when he's playing PLO, but he's only able to see two cards. Right. Yeah. You know that's like uh, he 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 has genuine reactions to that happening. So you know it's. Uh, I, I believe he had help. This is like, you know, he had like a little system going mm -hmm. and, uh, you know, how much money did he end up? Uh, uh, we don't, we don't we really know. Like it could have, it, it, it's hard to really keep track of exactly with the add-ons because the graphic team there, they don't really keep track of all the add-ons. So we don't really know exactly how much he's up, whether it's 125,000, whether it's 250,000, whether it's 175,000. So it's, it's impossible for us to really know unless you go through and watch every single second of yeah. every single video right now. So, yeah, but I have a little bit of knowledge to how uh, Maury and Carrie Katz run their operations. So when they're doing stuff for the for the World Series of Poker and all the Poker Go stuff, I mean, like nobody's allowed back there. in you know, the half an hour thing that that is delayed. That's what everybody else has access to. Mm -hmm. And uh, you know, um, uh, I guess if uh, if Maury or Carrie Katz decided to to uh, cheat us, then we'd be all in trouble but uh you know those yeah. guys are like the most straight arrow guys on the planet and uh, uh there's zero chance of that happening so how i guess how would you know in that situation too because i'm sure you play in games where it, and it seems like when you research the devices out there and, and how people have systems in home games i mean it you know it's it's a lot of things going on out there and it seems pretty easy to do if you're not aware of what's happening so how, i guess do you, do you worry about that or do pretty you stay easy aware to do. you don't have tv monitors and all that other stuff well a lot of the, the other programs as well too there's uh yeah they kind of go through the phone or they can go through headsets or anything like that too so if you have a certain marked deck then that can have a tracker with, with your phone or your keys or anything like that too mm -hmm. So I guess there there's a lot of different things it looks like that people can do from terms well, of just yeah. if you can get a deck in there and if you can have that. Well, with that in mind, then I would be concerned about RFID cards. And yeah, we're talking general, about. yeah, right, yeah. But this is this is infrared marking here too. Right. And then RFID cards is kind of the own separate thing as well too. Which, infrared marking. Yeah. Right. Yeah. But it, normal cards don't have infrared marking. Hope not. We'd hope not, right? Yeah. 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 And they don't have RFID either. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So, so I mean, this is not like. Uh, this not, is not, that, not that big of a worry. No, and, 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 and the best thing to do is just play inside a casino because yeah. the casinos have all kinds of surveillance to make sure that shit doesn't happen. That's why, you know, the lawsuit even going against that casino, whatever, you know, it's good for them to clean up their act. Even if nothing comes of the lawsuit except that, hey, we got to tighten up, you know, because this, is, I always recommend if you ever get a chance and somebody says, well, why don't we play at my home? It's better to play in a casino if you have okay. a choice. Yeah. And, and especially if they're pushy to play at their home, then for then, sure I'd want to play in a casino. Well, I'm, I'm yeah. sure you get that a lot I mean, too yeah. with people pushing you to play in games and they want to invite you to games and I'm sure they'll say, I'll fly you here or I'll do this or do that kind of thing like mm -hmm. that. Do you just kind of say no to certain things like that or? or? I think, I, 
listen, uh, I like to play with people that I know and game operators, people that are running the game, people that have clean, good reputations. Mm. And I honestly have not had negative experiences uh, on, on that type of thing. Right. I had, uh, uh, you know, in, in Ultimate Bet, I believe I got just worked for a lot of money on there. Mm. And I remember Eric Lindgren once saying something about how it's not, it's not just uh, the money you lost. But how about the confidence that you suffered and might have caused you to play, you know, less optimal in other situations? Right. And that's exactly what was happening with me. I mean, I kept kept losing when I thought I was supposed to be winning, and uh, and then all of a sudden now my confidence is all shaken because I, I don't understand what's happening. And uh, you know, so so it's just bad for poker when something like this happens, and it's good for you guys to expose it. Yeah. yeah, people say, uh, I said other people are obsessed with it. Well, one, people are obsessed with it. And two, they said, I am obsessed with it. Well, clearly I'm obsessed with it because I did 10 live streams and multiple different videos about the situation. So it's, uh, I mean, it's one of those fascinating things I've ever really seen in poker because I wasn't around uh, very in depth in poker yet when the whole entire ultimate bet thing went down with the Russ Hamilton. So kind of seeing this and then seeing it happen on live stream, it's just like, I've never really seen this before. So. And you kind of mentioned one thing about the the toll it takes on you as the player, and you can see it in these players' faces. Like they're some of these guys get beat down by this dude consistently, and you can just see the dejected look when they make a bluff, and this dude snaps him off after after he stares down deep into his crotch. It's just, you know, it's disheartening, man. I mean, that's what he does. You, there's every big, just every time. I mean, you know, and then I don't know. You probably. You probably don't see people staring in the crotch very often in the games you're playing, no, right? No, 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 no. The, uh, the, the games, I, I try and play with games that have like a clean reputation forever. And, uh, you know, like I said, you know, if you, st if you stick in casinos, you're fine. And uh, I would only play in home games where you know, you know, you you know, know they, they have a stellar reputation. Right. And on, honorable people. Yeah, just not, not even take the risk. Yeah. Yeah. Shout out to everybody in the chat. You want to give us some shout outs? Do you have a shout anybody out there you want to give? Maybe somebody watching? Uh, just. <laughs> Um, I'm, I'm here if anybody has like a couple questions to answer. Sure, yeah, I definitely, uh, there was a lot of questions kind of submitted, we'll kind of run through them over here. I wrote down some from Twitter and some from, uh, and some from the, mainly Twitter when you posted on there too. So people want to know the biggest pot you've ever played. Um, biggest pot I ever played. Uh, yeah, I, 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 we were all at uh, Jewel. And um, the nightclub. Was, yeah, Jewel the nightclub was okay. with Kevin Hart and Steve Aoki and some other people, and we went back and we'd all been having a few drinks, and just first hand back and uh, first hand back, I get back and I got aces and uh, Bobby Baldwin had kings, and we do a series of raising, and uh, he and I have played a lot of poker together, and we, we don't get into big pots normally, you know. Mm -hmm. You normally, if he re raises me, I'm like likely to get out of there. And we get all the money in, 1.3 million each. And uh, wow. he hit that king on the turn on me. And I mean, that was like, Phew. and I think that was the, that was the end of my personal bankroll. Yeah, that, 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 that you know, yeah, but maybe it was a good thing because that was the start of the relationship with Robel. And, uh, you know, you know, and, and we've been good ever since. So, so yeah, but yeah, that was, I did beat Bobby back a huge pot where I drew out on him. I had a plush draw, and he had a set or something like that. Mm -hmm. uh, I did that uh, in, in another huge game, but that was uh, th th those were both about two and a half million dollar pots. Yeah. Wow! Yeah, yeah. So, so you go to the nightclub, you come back, you lose that pot, and then that's when you have to go find the backer because obviously you have experience having backers before. But that kind of well, that, that 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 put that depleted my personal bankroll. That Jeez. was that was the end of it. That was that was you had the roll on the point, table. Two point six million dollar. I mean, relatively. I mean, right. I might have had like a hundred thousand left or something like that. But I mean, that was that was it. I, I was no longer able to fund myself in high stakes cash games. What, what makes you so open about? Because a lot of people ask about the, the relationship with Andrew Robel. What makes you guys so open about sharing this this being staked? Um, well, first of all. Um, we're uh, like to be transparent, mm -hmm. you know. And uh, there are times when he and I are in a same at, at the same game, and we like for everybody to know. And, and by the way, if there's a new player that comes in, we always like tell him right away. By the way, you know, I'm playing uh, and, mm -hmm. Andrew Stakes me on it. And then 
within 25 minutes, you can see that Andrew and I are always trying to bust each other at the table anyway. So right. And, uh, it's kind of it's kind of crazy, but uh, the guy has felt at me quite a few times. Yeah, <laughs> but uh, no, uh, and and we, we play really hard against each other, and uh, uh, you know that's part of the people people want to play with me, so they they enjoy Robles company and everything, but obviously nobody's necessarily looking to play with with a solid good player. You right, know what I mean? because, but because you're in the game, then they accept it. Okay, that yeah, makes sense. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So it's like a, it's like a kind of a two for one deal, right? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Seems like a good deal for for all three sides, I guess. Then in some ways, it it, it really is. Yeah. It really is. And 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 Andrew's extremely pleasant and uh, fun to be around. And you know, and, and, and it's not like he wins every time. He wins and loses. He and I had a, a series where we played forty days straight during a World Series three years ago, and. Uh, he ended up dead even for the entire series. You imagine Andrew playing 40 days with a bunch of recreational players at the end of 40 and days. Even, yeah. and dead even for the entire, that's a true story. And I lost. He bent 40 days and I lost. And we played with, I mean, so the, some of the juiciest games you've ever seen. Yeah, sometimes, <laughs> it's, good, sometimes it's good to take a day, day or two off, yeah. even though no matter how, how good games can be, because it kind of refreshes your mind a little bit. Especially when you go 40 days straight playing poker, your mind's all discombobulated by the third week and you don't even know the fuck you're at sometimes so it's uh well that, it also shows you the variance you know that you know you can play solid poker and just run like ass for you know what i mean it's, right. it's quite possible it doesn't that sound like kind of crazy that you could play 40 days at, at, at his level of poker and break it dead even yeah I, I i it makes sense it's just i guess the mindset you have when you play 40 days in a row because i played 40 days in a row oh, yeah. way too many times yeah. it's like you're not once you have some 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 run bad kind of just fucks up your entire mind and and you don't even realize it until after the fact and then you look back on the play and you said well yeah i maybe i wasn't really playing my best in a lot of spots in a lot of situations and that's mm. one thing i wish i did a lot when i was younger is just take breaks very very good point yeah i very wish i just point. kind of just to reset the fundamentals because take a few days off come back and all of a sudden i'm like a different person whereas when you keep playing through there by the third or fourth week you're just you don't even have time to really reflect on what you've been doing what you've been playing it's just you know you're so entrenched in the moment that you can't really take a step back so that's one of my biggest things i wish i didn't do was play every day <laughs> yeah yeah no it's a good point and we've talked about that for sure you're gonna have to schedule some breaks here and there even even, even when the situation is really good yeah i'll shout out to everybody on youtube we have a, a few of these a two dollar donation from miguel rodriguez jr b is the god of poker he's a god <laughs> Did they ever call you that he's a god yeah. Not a dork. He's not a donk. He's a dork. What? what? I don't know. They're, they're I think I don't think they're talking about you. Do they? I don't think oh, they'll call you. Oh, they're talking about someone else. Okay. I don't know. They're yeah, talking yeah, about yes. guys. If you're joining this podcast on YouTube, uh, JRB is well well aware of how YouTube works. He says you guys got to smash that like button if you want to see him play. Are you gonna play in Rob Young's home game on Poker Go in uh, December? Um, there's this, a little bit. Here. There's discussion <laughs> of uh, there's discussion of it. He, he he's invited me and. Uh, um, I, I'm sure I'm going to make an appearance. Yeah, there. yeah, yeah. Do you yeah. guys want to? Rob, see I really, really like Rob. By the way, yeah, he, he gives a lot of action too. It's not just that he gives a lot of action. He has a true love affinity for the game and just wants to see great things happen for it. He's devoted to. He understands the mindset of the player, mm -hmm. and he's got the players back. Like I really think that he's trying to make it better for the player. Right. It's rare to, for to see people in poker have that these days because it seems like most people are so on the operator side of things and they right. don't necessarily have the, the players back and they're not looking out for the professional poker players or they're not looking out for people who are trying to make money at the game and trying to sort of build poker into something they're just trying to maximize the profit in the short term for the operator side of things and or maximize their profit for themselves in a lot of ways too. So it's very rare to see people like Rob who are like, okay, what can I do here to help put on events or put on a good show or to grow poker and grow the audience like that and just maybe give something entertaining to the audience we have in the industry itself right now to give them hope that we can continue to make a living at poker people out there continue to win so I think seeing what Rob's doing compared to what other people have done is I think it's amazing to have something like that it's good it's good right now it's good and by the way the things that Daniel does for the community and it, 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 it it's it's fantastic I mean it, these guys are really they want the best for the future of poker. And uh, part of the reason why I agreed to come do this show with you is because I liked what you were doing. You're adding a whole new enthusiasm 
to the to the game, and you you, you make you, you make it fun also. Yeah, that's you're, you're you're one of the fun parts of poker right now, and, and I'm glad to be a part of this with you and to do this podcast. Thank you. you. Yeah, I think that's something that I've always just. That's why I started doing content like five years ago. That's why I started making PLO videos and doing my podcast. Is just I just love talking poker. I love poker. I think it's changed my life in a lot of ways, and and I don't even know what my life would be like without poker back in the day if I didn't find it. So I I feel like I. I just kind of like to share that with other people because I know other people love it as well too. And I know there's a lot of poker players who love it as well too. And and they, a lot of poker players want to hear other people talk about it with that same enthusiasm as well too. So that's why I just figured, well, if I, I would like this show, I'm going to create. So I just try to do something that I know I would like as a player and as a fan. So it seems like it works and it seems like people enjoy it. So I don't know. It's just I've always had a big passion for poker and it's just... I, I'm actually yeah. a little jealous of you too because... You know, when, when I first got off of Survivor, they wanted me to do a podcast regarding Survivor. Mm -hmm. And I was thinking I could have done a, a, a Survivor podcast that kind of went into poker and everything, too. Could have been kind of cool, but I never did it. And I'm seeing you right now. And I'm like, wow, if I had done this 10 years ago, might have might have been a hit, too. Yeah, it's not, yeah. not too late to start, really. Ever, ah, you know? I mean, yeah. I know you're doing a lot of different things and you got the family now as well, too. But I mean, these days, it's very easy. You have a microphone, and if you know people, like I mean, I know a lot of people now, so it's just right. you. Well, if I do a podcast, you'll 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 come be a guest with me. I I, I definitely will come <laughs> on, but I feel like you can get a lot of a lot of really great guests and a lot of really cool stories, and I think people just in here enjoy hearing you speak, and you have your own sort of stories as well too. And I think the more knowledgeable and entertaining the host has, is and the perspective that the host has, the more potential that your show has in a lot of ways too, because people tune in not just for the guests, but they tune in to hear what you have to say and then the interaction between the two of you as well, too. So I feel like you'd have a, uh, you'd probably be better at, I mean, I, I feel like you'd already be good at that. You don't even, you don't even yeah, you've probably be done fun. it before, right? You never even tried it before. No, no, no. But so, uh, yeah, that, that's interesting because I, I do know a lot of cool people that uh, people would enjoy hearing from. Well, it seems like you like learning, too. Do you enjoy learning? <laughs> Absolutely. Enjoy, right. I think if you enjoy learning, basically what a podcast is to me is it's just learning. You know, I get to learn about you. You get to share stories about these these things, of, of experiences you've had in poker, and I just get to hear them as a fan of poker and as someone who enjoys learning about people. And then when you tell me about yourself, I can kind of build up this sort of idea of who you are in my mind from the information that you're saying and from the information that you're not saying. And then sort of I just get a better idea of you as a person. And then I take a few things away in terms of maybe uh, just whatever I gather, whether it's strategically or whether it's just personality-wise or whether it's experience-wise. So. That's why I love doing these shows, and it's, I just look at it like it's very well it's said, just, just learning yeah. and researching, and you know, it's like it's like the investigations are basically learning to me too. It's just I'm learning about what took place, or and uh, I mean, having poker players on, I love it. You know what I mean? I've just been, I, it's just I don't know, I don't explain it. People say, why don't I do podcasts outside of poker more? But I love poker first and foremost, and mm -hmm. uh, you know, so that's why I like talking about it. So, do you play any PLO, Pop Manoha? The great game? Um, I am terrible at PLO, and I love it. You love it? I absolutely love it. And I have the worst PLO record ever. And uh, I'm allowed to play PLO on my own. Robo refuses to have any piece of me. It doesn't matter how juicy the game is. I've been in the most incredible games. He will not take any piece of me. I'm a consistent loser in PLO. Yeah. Yes. yeah. I think uh, I think we played a little bit on an online site before. And I know you should know you play a lot of hands pretty well. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> There was a lot of 1020 on a Poker Boss, it was called, uh, and uh, yeah. my name was Pizza Shark on there. Oh, I, was that right? Yeah, I had I, I played, um, I mean, not, not a lot of games right on there very much, so shout out to Pizza Shark, but I don't think I've ever told anybody the screen name on there. But yeah, it was uh, it was a lot of fun. I didn't remember, you, like for some I reason, you would, come lo you would come play, and, and you would always load up four tables, and I was like, why is he play? Like, why isn't he just one table or two tables? You'd always love four tables. <laughs> like, what is this guy doing? This guy's insane. Like, why would you love four tables? Well, first of all, it was a small game. And yeah, it's I was true, having right? a blast. Right. And I was just like, and I do enjoy playing a lot of PLO hands. Yes. Maybe that's my downfall. Yeah, it might yeah, be. Yeah, maybe yeah, it's a little yeah. tight. tight. Mm. Maybe it's more the game for you. You just don't know it. Yeah. You tighten up, <laughs> tighten up a little bit there. So. A little P um, PLO with pizza. P what, what, what was pizza it? Pizza Shark. Uh, pizza Shark. Pizza yeah. Shark. Yeah. I mean, listen, I like pizzas. I like Shark. It's a yeah. great screen name, man. <laughs> uh, Nick Shulman was on the podcast recently, and he talked about playing uh, pool with you. Uh -huh. And he said, yeah, I know, you can just get easy. Yeah. yeah. Okay, go ahead. Perfect. Yeah, it's mm -hmm. good. And he talked about that when you, there was nothing quite like when you're winning at pool because you start singing, you know, every 80s song, you're dancing, you're you're doing a little like, a little, little hand rhythm with oh. your hand, stuff like that. So what, What's up with this? Uh, and by the way, when Nick starts winning, all of a sudden he knows 80s. Uh, he, he, okay. he, he gives it right back to me. 
And he's like, yeah, yeah, do you really want to hurt? Whatever. He's just, you know, playing pool with Nick is just so fun. Actually, people would enjoy a video of the two of us playing each other because we're always busting each other's balls and we're fighting real hard to win. Yeah. And, and uh, we play a game called One Pocket, which is uh, a lot more strategy. It's like the chess of pool. And uh, he's a much better shooter than I am. Mm -hmm. Like if we played nine ball, I, he just completely destroyed me. But in One Pocket, I'm close to his speed because he what's one pocket one pocket it, it, it's it's a strategy where you got to make eight balls in one corner and i got to make eight balls in the other corner and oh, it's wow. all defense and it's a fascinating game it's funny because like guys that love poker like joe cassie and Nanad, they can't shoot pool at all mike the hat but they're fascinated with the game mm -hmm. like mike actually loves mike's actually gotten pretty decent at the game and he doesn't play pool very well at all yeah billy o'neill yeah Anyways, it's a lot of fun. If you ever if you ever get a chance, watch the game in one pocket. They can't really televise it because a game could be five minutes, it could be one hour. Mm -hmm. So there's no way to do commercial breaks and all that. So, uh, you, you, but you can watch it on YouTube. They they have plenty of great one yeah, pocket. Yeah, never never heard of it before. Yeah, yeah, it's yeah, eight yeah. ball, nine ball, kind of the, the yeah. normal kind of pool thing. So how did you learn every eighty song? Is that just you just listen to a lot of music and now you know every eighty song? I. I don't know every 80s song, but I love 80s. I've always loved 80s. And uh, I just turned 49 a few weeks ago. And for my 50th birthday party, I'm uh -oh. going to do an 80s theme. Uh, 80s theme movie. party? Yeah, yeah, I'm going to do a like, massive you know, party. You yeah. think like a performer maybe or something? Yeah. Do you have a favorite performer from the 80s that you like? There, uh, bon Jovi? <laughs> did, Let's get did. Bon Jovi there. <laughs> bon Jovi's more 90s, bro. You think so? Yeah, I think so. I, I only I'm listen a, to their 80s songs yeah, personally. Bon Jovi's but 90s. I, I definitely only listen to 80s songs. I, I, yeah, I like the more first couple albums and yeah. 90s stuff I don't really listen to as much. So. There's a group out of uh, L.A. that uh, sings 80s. just amazing. And for some reason, the, the name just slipped my head, but... Uh, Liz, not Liz, oh, wow, Spasmatics, mm -hmm. and I'm really hoping to book the Spasmatics for get them for it. Yes, yes, yes. Do you have a favorite horrible. song? Is it like uh, Whitney Houston? Was it what's mm -hmm. that one song? What's the song about Adderall? The bring me a Adderall. Oh, oh, let's bring one? me a higher love. Oh, My bad. Right, yeah, right, I don't right, know. Right. <laughs> Yeah, that's. By we always way, used to sing that song. Bring me an Adderall. We that, just like putting Adderall in songs that was, for some reason. That was Steve Winwood. Did Whitney Houston sing that also? I, I, I think so, yeah. I yeah. think she did. I think she popularized it for me personally. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, that was, uh, that was Steve Winwood, and she probably redid it. That's the, right. The I chat, the chat definitely yeah. knows that too, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Billy Joel. Oh, man. Shoot. If, uh, when Hollow Notes come to town, I mean, mm -hmm. I can't wait to go see them. Uh, Does your wife know who these, these groups are? She is getting to know just because I play a lot of '80s, so yeah. she's getting to know a lot more about it. But, Does uh, she listen to like salsa music, Latin music, stuff like that? Um, no, I, I mean, no. She, maybe on her own. Oh, okay, I, but now, know, I mean, maybe you yeah, guys are all yeah, listening. Yeah, no, I she's, can see salsa. You seem like a good dancer. No, you don't no, think so? No, I could see you just no, having some wicked no, dance moves. No, 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 no. You can't twirl them on the floor a little bit. No. Kind of get out there, show your moves on the dance floor. <laughs> Um, I think you. No, do. I don't know. I can no, see it. No, no. And you and you know a lot of languages as well too, right? You know, you know more than more than just English. Um, I, I a little I bit. Speak, I speak some Mandarin, mm -hmm. and uh, French was my language before English, but I don't really speak French. But I'll, I'll understand quite a bit. Yeah. I've done a lot of traveling, so you know, language is really important. Uh, my kids, um, you know, the nanny's going to be speaking to them in Spanish, and uh, when they're a little older, I'll get them some lessons either. Chinese or mm -hmm. French yeah I studied Mandarin for a very brief time period I had a prop bet where I needed to learn Mandarin in one year and uh, once I started I was like ah, yeah, I probably shouldn't you, you, just no, bought, I, you bought out of I, that yeah, prop bet I, 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 I knew I was gonna lose profit basically yeah it was uh I mean I, I could have put more effort into it but it, it's a very it's a very different language in terms of the tones and how that works and uh, yeah it's Joey I, I, I hate to cut you early but uh, I got uh, a cash game that actually started 20 minutes ago that I'm late for. Let's do it. Yeah, let's let's get let's wrap it up here, guys. Let's get one more thing, guys. If you guys want one more question, wrap it up, and then we're gonna let JRB. He's gonna get out of here. The man loves to gamble at the highest stakes. So, <laughs> you guys, let me know one more thing, and then that's it. And then I'll be back with new videos on Friday, Saturday, and then all next week at noon Eastern time. I have a new series coming out, and uh, it's gonna be related to Mike Postle's worst session where he definitely was the most out of line person I've ever seen in my life. So the crotch staring, <laughs> the perfect plays, it's, it's his biggest cheating session essentially. 
Of mm -hmm. the entire, yeah, of the entire 69 or 80 sessions or so like that. So I basically want everyone to see it because it's such a, yeah, it's such blatant what's happening. Well, so I'll check it out. I, I'm going to break it down in, in little uh, more digestible parts of the thing. So cool. people are saying good luck out there. Thank you. Thanks. Give, I appreciate it. Just give the people an Ivy story and then we'll wrap it up. I see some Ivy an and Ivy stories story. out there. They, they love to fill Ivy stories around here, man. Yeah, Ivy story. Wow. Uh-huh. So I was at the Commerce, and uh, you know, I, I I went to boarding school. So you know, being around a bunch of guys and everything, and being naked or here or there is no big deal. Okay, I'm at the Commerce, and I needed a nap. I say Phil, and Phil's like, all right, just use my key, just go. So I go up to his hotel room upstairs, and I'm taking a nap, and he comes and knocks on the door. And I answered the door butt naked. I mean, he almost passed out. He's like, what the hell? I'm like, I'm like what's the big deal? I mean, dude, if you had seen the look of shock on his face, I'll never forget that. Very, very funny. That was like 15 years ago. But I, I just remember, you, 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 you wouldn't think that Phil Ivey could be so shocked, but he, dude. I'm <laughs> <laughs> yep. I don't, I don't know what prompted me to tell that story, but you got it. And then he let you back in the room again? <laughs> Dude, I don't know. <laughs> yeah. Well, guys, we're wrapping up on that note. If you enjoyed the podcast, smash the like button on YouTube. Leave a comment below as well, too. Uh, very much appreciate it. JRB, thank you for coming on. Great to have you on here, man. And uh, guys out there, appreciate all the comments, all the chatter. You guys are awesome, as always. And I'll be back tomorrow with a new video. That's it. Peace out. Take care, guys. All right. Adios.